on this Friday. We are excited to talk to you again about this topic. So today we have our special guest speaker, Dwayne uh, Barone, and he's going to talk to us about mental health, poverty, and race. So should be a great uh, discussion here. Dwayne is a dear friend, so we're looking forward to hearing from him. And just want to kind of start out before I do his intro with um, some kind of some of our ground rules. And so part of that is that we do create a safe space here for individuals. So all ideas are welcome. We're very, very grateful that you're all joining us here live and then for those who will watch the replay. So um, Suman and I are here every Friday at noon EST uh, to have these conversations, different topic every week, which is uh, really fun so that we put out a calendar and then you're able to see kind of what's going on for the month or what those topics are. They're super excited that it looks like we probably have the rest of the year just about rounded out on that. So we're very, very blessed and grateful for our speakers and for all of you who come each week to join us. I will say um, we are recording, I'll remind again. So if there's something that you're not comfortable sharing or you have some concerns, feel free. We usually stay a little bit afterwards um, to uh, you know share that or hold it back until after we're done recording. Um, the other thing is we do every, the last Friday of every month, we do host an unrecorded session. So that is another opportunity where we're not recording that you can come and freely share. We encourage you to do that anyway, but um, sometimes people are not comfortable or because of their, um, you know, where they work or whatnot, they may not want to share. And so I just want to throw that out there because we do record these, we do uh, put them online. So whatever you're sharing, just know that feel free to turn your camera off too um, or use the chat function. So Suman, anything I missed before we, uh, before I do Dwayne's bio? Nope, you were fantastic, covered everything. It's great to see everyone, I'm really excited. Our group is growing, so thank you all for sharing uh, the link and the information and for showing up with us. Absolutely, fantastic. All right, well, without further ado, I will introduce uh, Dwayne here. So Dwayne graduated Texas A&M with a psychology degree to pursue sports psychology after years in competitive sports. I'm glad someone is uh, sportsy because that's not me. Um, he worked at a residential children's care facility and cleaned bathrooms, ensured that no one escaped, and helped with morning uh, breakfast prep and routines, and he was reading a lot of files. Um, so what he came to find out is that less than 10% of those people would avoid mental health, substance abuse, and the legal system as they moved into adulthood. After he got his uh, master's degree in clinical psychology, Dwayne spent three years as a case manager in community-based vocational training and employment, supporting adults with intellectual disabilities. He enjoyed the work. He wanted a greater challenge. And so he landed a mental health clinician position um, at a community health center who, where he served uh, chronically mental ill uh, adults who are struggling to function in the community. He helped them cope with things such as hallucinations, depression, delusions, <laughs> mood swings, living skills, and support to prevent rehospitalization. Uh, critical piece there. Um, Duane has many lived experiences, including um, experiencing bullying and racism. So I can't wait to get into that uh, with him. He has developed a theory on poverty. Each part of our journey is meant to build on the past experiences to keep growing our foundation and knowledge and perspectives. So Dwayne works really hard to educate children in inclusivity and acceptance. Without further ado, I give you Mr. Dwayne Marone. Dwayne, uh, feel free to add to that, that lovely bio, if you will. Thanks, Tiffany. I think it's tough. Gosh, it's been 31 years at least already. So, you know, I just turned 55 this summer. I'm a major speed limit, right? Um, all I can say is it's all about people. It's all about relationships, and it seems to be everywhere I've gone. Um, it's just been nice trying to get to know people and my career literally, literally has been trying to help the most broken of people fix themselves and develop a healthy path forward so that they can function better. That now takes me into the whole domestic violence piece, which is what my career is for the last 16 years, working with family violence. And so what we find is how much hurt and pain seems to get carried forward from childhood into our adulthood. And it just seems to play out like a program in their adult relationships and in their family now that they're a parent. It's crazy, absolutely crazy. But then again, it's also totally logical. Um, the word that has come up in my work that is almost one of the most feared and regretted is normal. Now, 
we all want to be normal. We all hope we're normal. We all strive for these things. Our, our community and our societies, they actually want conformity. They want uniformity. That's something that we as human beings like. So that changes our normal in a different way as well. You know, in one way, we're all trying to find this normal that we can all have, we can all share, and we can all experience and move on kind of in a healthy function together. But if you think about a bell-shaped curve, you've got two sides of that, right? If you had a positive, healthy side in a family on a bell-shaped curve, but then the other side of the curve is unhealthy. And of course, at those ends, you have these small percentages of super healthy and maybe super negative, super caustic, super toxic. In the middle, you have two thirds, which is considered normal. Well, if you have positive on one half and negative on the other half, that means two thirds looks like it's gotta have a whole lot of mixture. Mixtures of good, mixtures of bad experiences, mixtures of what people are just trying to do to cope with their daily lives as parents, as children, as teenagers, as whomever. And that mixture will hurt people in different ways. So we can have some, you know, sibling rivalry is kind of a normal concept, right? But what does that mean? Well, that means one person may be a little jealous of the other, one person may be trying to keep their position in the family and keep the other one down. Um, you have parents that rightly or wrongly may favor one child over the other for whatever reason that is. So there's going to be positive experiences for one and a negative experience for the other. Each one's going to take that experience and internalize it. And then that's what they take forward in their life as far as who am I? How does life operate? How does this work? Does that make sense? And I don't know if I'm starting this off right at all. <laughs> I gotta be, I gotta be honest. But like I'm saying, this normal, because when I do an intake with somebody who's been arrested for domestic violence, basically everybody comes there after they've pled guilty. So they've been arrested, they've gone through the legal system, they pled guilty because the DA offered them reduced charges and often what is referred to as a deferred sentence. And a deferred sentence or a deferred judgment means when you finish your treatment obligations, when you finish your probation obligations, um, this will be shown as dismissed on your record. It's not like it will go away and be erased, but it will say dismissed as opposed to convicted. Well, that's obviously a very positive thing for somebody if you know, they don't have a criminal conviction on their record before. This is a normal individual, Jane Joe, that had a fight with their husband and wife and end up having the cops called. Now, that's pretty severe in itself that police get called, but at the same time, I've worked with a lot of private um, voluntary clients and their marriages and their relationships sounded exactly the same as the court ordered clients who had the cops called. So there's again, not a whole lot of difference out there between whether you had the police called because you had a conflict and fight or not. One of those normals out there is many families grow up and the cops are the enemies, the police are the enemy. So you better not call the police. In fact, that's the last thing in the world we wanna do is involve the police or involve social services, right? Because they'll take our kids away. And everybody in my field, all the clientele, have grown up hating social services. So here's a reality with that bell-shaped curve. I've never met anybody professionally that came from a happy, healthy home. Does that make sense? I only have people who have deep hurts, deep traumas, and very distorted views of how relationships are supposed to work how male-female relationships are supposed to work, and if it's a gay relationship, how they as individuals are supposed to work together. It's always grossly distorted. That's their normal. That's probably why normal is this word that I've come to hate every time I get to meet somebody, because their normal isn't what my normal was. I was lucky. I had happy parents. I had pretty healthy parents. 
I moved around a lot, so I was always an outsider. I did eventually get to find out that I was stolen from my mom, though, at six months of age. So the story fits into domestic violence, and it fits into insecurity and stuff like that, too. So anyhow, I feel like I'm going to get lost. You start directing those questions, or I'm going to go down some rabbit holes. <laughs> I thought I clicked. I didn't click hard enough. Um, I was trying to give uh, some deference to Suman over here because it looked like she went off mute earlier. Um, did you did you want to go? I did. I had a couple of questions about <clears throat> what you've been talking about. So have you noticed, and I don't know if there's any research on this or, um, or anecdotal information on this, but have you noticed how socioeconomics might impact this sort of normal and how that plays a role in all of this, the, the work that you do? Yes, but it may or may not be what you think. So I've worked with people who were wealthy, plenty of money, but we could still fight over money because somebody could have an addiction issue. We still might not have enough money, or I still might use money to control you as an individual. Um, when we think of the good old traditional role of a working husband and the stay-at-home wife, there's an immediate power imbalance that is built into this. And we do see that there are higher numbers and statistics of domestic violence in single household families. So, it doesn't matter whether that's a wealthy family or a poor family, we still see that power imbalance and that dynamic. Now, in a poorer family, we're talking about less resources. So, you know, it's harder to pay the rent. It's harder to pay for the groceries. It's harder to pay for all the bills. It's harder to pay for any extraneous expenses and miscellaneous stuff. Um, male pride is a problem. That is a reality. It's a very fragile ecosystem. Um, men who are not working are typically very depressed, very upset. They tend to drink more. That'll take our money. That'll change my mood. That'll change my reactivity and it sure as heck will change my reactivity level, right? So we will see that money is gonna be a factor in there because if I have an addiction issue I need the money from me and I'll be taking it from my family. If that money has been spent on clothes for the kids because the school year just started and groceries and I think you spent too much money on that stuff, oh, I'm going to get mad at you and I will fight you for it. I will fight you about it. If we're separated, money gets used frequently as a control mechanism because again the mom may not be working or she's only working a, a low paying part-time job the traditional guy i work with probably likes to work about 60 hours a week in a very hands-on business so um, they're gone a lot and then of course because they work so much and they are so tired and exhausted they come home they're in a bad mood but when it comes to money it's about their decision making. It's what they think they get to decide to do with it. Again, very traditional, very traditional outlooks if you think about that. We're still, we're still changing some of that out there and it's slowly by surely and it's one person at a time, one family at a time, et cetera. But it's still pretty prevalent. And that comes into rural areas and that also comes into urban areas. And it's across all races. The reality is male domination has been out there forever. And I'm pretty certain, I joke with my guys all the time to try to make points. Adam would have been chasing Eve all around that garden, apple or no apple, snake or no snake. Okay? And so he wants to be in control, and it's been written into the Bible since the beginning. So it's still out there. It is still out there. So Dwayne, like back to, um, so one of the organizations that I used to work for many moons ago um, was a nonprofit and we did a lot with, well, it had a, a nonprofit uh, component to it, but it was a lot of group therapy, anger management, um, 
uh, deferred prosecution, all of those types of things. So I'm very familiar with that concept and actually I helped build the program for that, which taught me a lot. And that's how I've come to know a lot of the things you're, you've talked about. Um, in my experience working through that, mm -hmm. a lot of the clients that we had were black males. Have you seen that we had white females? We had, because there's rope in like anger management issues, substance abuse, uh, legal issues. There's all of those things that come into play. But have you, what's been your experience? Have you seen a lot of disparity there? I have worked with everybody you can imagine. I have worked with black gangbangers, Hispanic gangbangers, and Asian gangbangers. I've worked with white trailer trash. I have worked with white psychiatrists and lawyers. I have worked with every race under the sun, and I have worked with pretty much people who have immigrated from most areas of the world as well. So discrimination came into their roles every single time as a child. So whether it was kids coming from Vietnam in the 70s to Houston, whether it was kids immigrating from China to New York when they were little, it didn't matter. They always went and experienced discrimination wherever they went. They learned to fight very early to defend their honor and defend their family and defend themselves. So I don't know how that fits into the question, but yeah, I mean, I've seen plenty of people that have long records, if you might say. Um, I've had people who have zero criminal history, and again, that comes across all races, and I've had people who have incredibly long rap sheets, and that's come across all races. So I couldn't tell you that one group of people had a longer rap sheet than the other group of people, because I've worked with a lot of poor whites, and so their rap sheet looks about the same as the poor black men but it also looks the same as the poor Hispanic man and the poor Asian man. They all have basically the same types of rap sheet too, same types of crimes. It's so interesting. Do you, have you seen from a, the a perspective of recidivism, have you seen or how have you seen kind of the system either fail people or how, how has that kind of impacted whether or not uh, these offenses kind of reoccur. Okay, um, well, two things about that. Being socially enfranchised, such as a working individual who's got their family and has um, personal goals and things like that that they want to attain educationally and career-wise, those people tend to succeed much more. Those people tend to be more motivated and invested in the process and the learning. The ones who are socially disenfranchised, not working, prefer not to work, um, would prefer the criminal life, they're the ones who will not succeed. So there's something in their personalities, there's something in their psychology, there's something in their way of life that they're not willing to change and look at. Um, is that going in the right direction? Because the recidivism piece really is gonna come down to, do I choose to stay abusive? Do I choose to use violence and anger in my problem solving and trying to control the situations? Um, a lot of times when I've seen people, uh, for instance, I've got a new guy, he's relatively young, he's probably in his early 30s by now. He was arrested and went somewhere else 10 years ago for domestic violence. It was in another relationship, it was with a different person, you know, he continued to live his life and maybe he lived a little better and maybe he really didn't. A lot of times the people in their 20s don't internalize the information enough. They're a little too bulletproof, they're a little too immortal still. Um, again, older clients tend to do better at wanting to internalize it, seeing it a little bit more clearly, willing to open up their minds a little bit more. They tend to be a little bit more invested and motivated to keep their families healthy and, and put back together. Um, uh, people that I've personally worked with that recidivated, they did tend to have much less severe um, incidents. 
So they had definitely got rid of the worst of their aggressive behaviors. They may have been arrested at one point for something like a third degree assault in the past. And this time it was only a harassment. Maybe it was a threatening text. Maybe it was an angry text as opposed to actually putting hands on somebody as they had in the past. So we see a harm reduction effect, hopefully. And the people who aren't gonna change, hopefully we can identify them relatively quickly, probably before the mid stage of treatment and get rid of them because often they're too caustic, they're too toxic to the group process. So as far as recidivism goes and stuff like that, um, issues associated with recidivism are going to be personality traits. So somebody who has antisocial personality which is very much criminal thinking. I don't need to follow the rules. I don't have to care about anybody else. There is no compassion. Those people probably will not change. If they're severe enough, if they're severe enough in their patterns, severe enough in their personality traits, they'll, they're the ones who are more likely, I would rather go to prison than to go do probation and treatment and counseling. Because there really are people out there who choose jail and choose prison. They choose not to go to prison. I mean, to go into counseling. So they do think it's their right. It's all part of the game for them. Um, you see a lot of narcissism, of course. And again, that sounds terrible um, when you see it maybe in our public as ugly as we're seeing it right now. And I guess I'll try to keep the politics out of it, but ultimately we see a horrible narcissist out there in the public every day. And he probably represents the worst of it. But on the flip side of it, one of the things about it, narcissism is, it's not always that I feel superior. Sometimes I actually feel very inferior. And often what this really is, is, I came from a family where I wasn't valued, I wasn't respected, I didn't feel loved, I didn't receive all this nurturing that I need, and in fact, I got just the opposite. Well, at that point, an individual is probably going to get pretty selfish inside themselves, and when I grow up, when I get out of here, I'm going to go live my life my way, I'm going to go do what I want to do, nobody's going to tell me this, nobody's going to tell me that. So what will happen is they'll get into a relationship later on and ultimately they're looking to take from the relationship whatever they can because they didn't get anything in the family growing up. And they do it very subconsciously and they don't understand that it's happening too much. It can go from subtle to very overt. And then usually the mo more overt it is, the more obvious the abuses are gonna be. And then hopefully, a victim will be more capable of doing something for themselves. Interesting. So we actually have two questions in the comment section. Okay. Um, so the first one, and there might have been some allusion to the answers to these, but it would be great if we can just sort of focus on these the questions here. So the first okay. one is, what is the relationship between poverty levels and the All Lives Matter movement? Are poor white people more inclined than richer ones? to be against supportive initiatives for underrepresented groups, like in the war between the poor? I am gonna say I honestly have no idea. Um, I would, I don't know, but my speculation is that, because I've worked with a lot of poor whites and I've seen a lot of poor whites who are more liberal and probably very much more in tune with the poor black situation and experience. But I've also seen very poor whites who are so ultra right wing that they're still always in judgment of others. So I think that's going to depend a little bit on really who you're talking to and potentially what part of the country you're in. I don't know if that helps enough. I don't know if it helps enough, but um, what I, my, my personal feelings about the whole all lives matter thing is that it's basically people who are ignorant and really don't want to look at the bigger situation. I think 
their belief is that if I say everybody matters, then that means that I am not racist. And I really think that is a cover up. And, you know, I remember in the, I guess it was the 80s, early 90s, when I was first going through a lot of diversity and cultural trainings and stuff like that. I remember as a, I, be I believed a conscious white man, a very caring white man, I still struggled with the guilt of our ancestry and what my role would be as far as was my role about the past or is my role going forward. So obviously had to deal with a lot of the guilt. And I remember in the beginning, and I think I'd put this in a, an email to us, the concept of colorblind seemed like a reasonable place to be when you're coming out of the super racist 70s. And, and colorblind, I think when it originally kind of formulated, it was more like, I am not looking at your color to determine who you are and how I feel about you. I think it was, I think it was legitimate that I'm literally not going to look at your color in our relationship. I think over time it may have evolved into an easy place to settle and like I don't care with apathy. I, I think now because this is several decades later, um, <laughs> several, two and a half decades later, um, we have to see color. And if, if we refuse to see color, that's keeping our eyes closed. Because I need to see your color to have a sense of what you may have gone through and experienced. We need compassion and empathy out there and it's absent and it seems half of the population, right? We need compassion to understand what did other people go through? What are they, what are they feeling on a daily basis? And it is interesting because one of the really cool aspects of the therapy I provide to very angry and aggressive individuals is they start caring about other people again. They start listening to the other person's experience again. They start trying to put themselves in that person's shoes and remind themselves, oh yeah, that's right, I've been here too. Instead of just having the defenses up of I don't care, it's all about me. Did that help? I always feel like I go the yeah. wrong direction. No, you're doing great. It, it actually, I think it was a great response to that question. Um, and so the next question listed here is, do you think that economic support can help those people who are struggling more with mental health issues? Yes, and I very much believe in the bottom up economics versus the top down economics. I did start a business major, right? Um, because ultimately I, I see the political divide as one of selfishness versus willing to help others. And I think, I think one of the problems that has happened is when you see the adversities that minorities have faced in our country for so long, that if you don't continue to help, then you're just going to leave people stuck. And and again, as I see kind of conservative political theory, it's, I had my personal struggles, whatever family I came out of. I had to go through this, I had to go through that. I went through all my life, I got to my success, so I wanna keep every dime I've got. And oh, by the way, I want less government so I can keep more money. I think the liberal side of the, of the equation has always been more about compassion and understanding and trying to help others achieve more of an equality across our country and across all races. And it didn't matter whether you're black or Hispanic, if you come to this country because it was about freedom and about the ability to find your future, then why should we hold anybody back? Why wouldn't we create systems that are about helping everybody? And again, whether you're poor white, poor black, poor Hispanic or poor Asian, shouldn't matter. If you need help, you need help. But, but part of what you have to get in to do in those impoverished areas though is also change the psychology. You can't just give money because you can create programs, 
that educate and I think you can create programs that teach job skills and I think you can, can create problems that programs that get people into that functional part of society so that they get enfranchised but if you and that's the only way to change their psychology but I think if you only throw money as the resource then you won't really change anybody's psychology because they see themselves as victims they see themselves as victims of history. They see themselves as victims of the system. They see themselves as victim of today. And unfortunately, whether we're talking about economics or whether we're talking about domestic violence, learned helplessness is a thing. Learned helplessness is so real that you will stay stuck because I don't believe that I've got any hope, any help, any worth, or anything else like that. I mean, when we look at suicidality, helplessness, hopelessness, and worthlessness are the top three. What does that look like in economic terms, right? What does that look like if I'm in a relationship that I feel trapped in? What if that's a situation in my life where I feel like no matter what I do, it's not going to work out for me. No matter what I do, everything's used against me. I think you can apply that to everything. So we have another question here. Uh, what are some of the manifestations of mental health issues of people you've worked with that happened in the workplace? Okay. That is probably going to have some variation. Um, Wow, okay, so, so specifically with domestic violence, it is considered a very controllable behavior for the most part. So I will choose to be violent to get against this family member in my home, and allegedly that means I won't act violent against people in my workplace, allegedly. Now, potentially, when I look at the people I've worked with, that may apply to the white collar workers in professional jobs because their reputations of how people see them is very important to them and critical, right? So I might put on this wonderful face at work. I might be this incredibly supportive and, and maybe encouraging supportive individual at work, but obviously not at home. Well, being that dichotomous doesn't really make sense. So maybe this person is still kind of tough. They're still kind of mean. They're maybe not very compassionate at work at a white collar kind of setting, a professional setting. They have an intensity about them, perhaps. But most of the guys I've worked with work with their hands and they're in blue collar labor jobs. And um, they're yelling and shouting at each other all the time at work. Um, they'll miss work for depression issues. They'll drink a lot for depression issues. Um, they're irritable all the time, so they're highly reactive. They get into conflicts with coworkers constantly. That's actually a sign of a mental health issue is how poorly do I function with my coworkers? Am I yelling and shouting at them? Am I cussing them out? Am I calling them out? And guys have been known to fight at work. I would have to call that a sign. I mean, I understand that being born with the, uh, you know, XY combination makes us potentially more aggressive because of the testosterone. But it's amazing how many of the guys I grew, I work with have grown up watching the old country, you know, the old cowboy movies where you walk into the bar and you grab a couple of drinks and you have a beef with somebody and so you throw down and might makes right. They still operate that way because it was the role modeling they had. It was the normal they saw growing up. So I think it does matter, professional workplace versus more of a blue collar work environment. Um, absenteeism is a mental health symptom, um, the substance abuse piece, definitely. And they usually go hand in hand. 
So I know that you spoke earlier about how programs and different things that are that could potentially be available to help change sort of the patterns. Mm -hmm. I'd love if you would talk a little bit about the STARS program that you work on, or that's your baby in essence, because I think you're doing some amazing impactful work. Well, and I guess where I would be focusing in on there is I'm trying to help change the mentality of the kids. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not there to be able to offer them a job opportunity, but um, what I would hopefully be able to do is give them some information that might even spark their curiosity towards careers in the future by just simply being able to explain what the work is about. Um, you know, it's about helping people who aren't functioning well in life feel broken in some form or fashion. So with STARS, one of the interesting concepts is I've had, I've worked with thousands of people by now and probably at least 2000 men. And it seems that so many of them said, I wish I had this in high school. I would have been a better man. I would have been a better husband and I would have been a better father. Now I remind them that they were very bulletproof and pretty immortal back in their teenage days and they probably would have thought I was full of crap and don't tell me what I need to know about relationships and yada yada yada. And there's usually a pregnant pause and they agree. Um, <laughs> but they're like, but I would like to think that eventually it would resonate, that eventually it would kick in. Um, and that I would start to see that there was more truth to it type of thing. Well, the other interesting part is I have worked with teenagers over the years. I've worked with teenage girls when I worked in the uh, Division of Youth Corrections. Um, all the information I shared with them through the domestic violence stuff all resonated because they saw it all so clearly in their homes. Um, the teenagers that I've worked with in outpatient counseling, the beauty of working with teenagers is that they listen and they actually are hearing this information. And because they're still so young, the logic of it, it resonates. I haven't had a teenager yet. They go, oh yeah, that's totally right. That totally makes sense. And it's funny because we grow up thinking that humans are so illogical, that human reactions are so illogical. And sorry, of course, men want to think women are so emotional and illogical, right? So they're all wrong. It's actually incredibly logical. It's almost like physics. For every action, there is an equal or opposite reaction. So when we look at something like, we treat others how to treat us. We teach others how to treat us. It's a simple statement. If I treat you with aggression, what are your possible responses? You can either aggress back at me because obviously aggression is okay, or you may choose to passively back away from me because that scares me, right? Well, if I'm an aggressive individual and I like conflict, I don't mind that you fight back with me. That's cool. That's part of my vibe. That's part of my gig. Well, if I want to be in total control though, I might go find a passive individual who's going to back away from my intimidation. Well, on the flip side, if I'm that passive person and I just take it, I am teaching you to continue to control me and to abuse me. If I get in your grill and I fight you, I've become just as bad as you. So I am always trying to teach people about assertiveness, that middle ground, firm but fair, clear, concise, respectful, use the right words, ask the right questions, talk about your needs, talk about your feelings, talk about concerns, right? Well, if we can teach that to children in schools, then I'm hoping we can get rid of some teen dating violence because the statistics equal that of the adult dating world. We could reduce bullying, hopefully we could reduce substance abuse, and hopefully we could also make an impact on school shootings because bullying has been associated with the shooters, mental health issues have been associated with the shooters, and so have personality disorders. So I think we need to do a few different things. 
One, I think we need to teach educators about the kids that they're concerned about. And I think we need to teach them who those kids are so they can take a better approach. For instance, the alternative high school, the current alternative high school system is much better at caring for their kids, understanding their needs and helping them succeed. Very, very different method of old traditional schools. I wanna teach the general population about all of humanity. Because if I teach the general population, as one gentleman said, you know, we've seen this before and we've heard this before, I, but, but we didn't know why we need to pay so much attention to it. Now that I've seen it, I can't ignore it again because I understand what it goes to. So the general population becomes incredibly important because for a long time, of course, they're just going to ignore it because they don't think they're part of the problem. Well, I've worked with a lot of kids who are considered emos and goths. Those are those kids that are marginalized. Those are the kids that are depressed, they're anxious, they're abused at home, they feel rejected at home, they feel devalued at home. Well, they feel the same thing at school. So they're the marginalized kid off in the side. Well, they're the easy fodder for the bully, right? And the general population, they just look at them as weird and strange, but they don't know who they are and what they're going through. I want the general population to understand who that kid is so they can pull them into the fold, change their experience, help them have a healthier life. I want to explain to the general population about where the bully comes from. Because the bully is a kid who felt powerless, weak, and helpless at home. And as a boy, you're not allowed to be that. As a man, you are not allowed to be that. You are supposed to be tough. You have to take on all challenges. You cannot back down from a fight. You have to protect your family. Well, if I can't protect them from my dad, or I can't protect them from my mom, now I feel very powerless, and I feel weak, and I actually feel guilty and self-hatred. Well, I can't be stuck there. So how do I go feel powerful? I go find somebody to pick on so I can feel strong. So that's what the bully's doing. Well, if we teach the main population about the bullies, dynamics, then we can also teach them to buffer the kid that's marginalized. So bring the kid into the fold and help buffer and protect that kid. Have the general population be able to stand up to the bully. Teach the bully about who they are and get them thinking about themselves now as opposed to when they're 35 and court ordered. And it's interesting because I was able to go to um, Mountain Vista High School. Um, we've been doing racquetball lessons with their kids for a long time. And finally, uh, Mary DeBolt, she let me come into the classroom and present some materials to the kids. And it's a PE class. And so it was real interesting because the shorter, smaller, less athletic kids, the kids who were bullied and picked on, they were in the front of the class and sure enough, you ask how many kids have been bullied in here, man, they threw their hands up. Back half of the class, they had not been bullied. They did not put up their hands when I asked who, how, who in here has bullied somebody. They didn't put their hands up, but boy, I'll tell you what, their heads went down. They gave it away just like that. And it was also interesting because you could watch their faces as you would go through the conversations and you can watch and see how the information hit them. You can see how it would resonate. And so the idea is that if you get them thinking now, they'll be better off down the road. I want to say that I'm trying to help them rewrite the programs that they received, but I want to help them avoid the pitfalls that their parents may have put down on the road ahead of them. I want to give them the opportunity to change their futures. So that's the idea is bring curriculum into schools, educate kids. I used student athletes for healthy relationships as an avenue, targeting athletes because 
again, so many of the men I worked with were student athletes in high school. One of the really common stories is that they had athletic scholarships, but they lost them. And they often lost them in the summer after their high school year where they were out partying with friends and get into some sort of drunk driving accident or they get injured. They lose their scholarship and now they're pissed off. And when they are mad, they start drinking. And when they're mad, they start fighting. And when they're mad, all that stuff comes out. They have a lot of deep regrets that have to be worked through when they come into therapy. And there's a reason it lasts nine months to 12 months. Because they have a whole life to unravel. I figure if we give the kids the information now while they're young, they can consciously process it and they can be more conscious going forward and they can change that future. So Dwayne, do you have, um, I'm not sure how long STARS has been around in your program, but do you have data that shows, or are you tracking data that shows the impact of the program? And the, purpose, the reason I'm asking that is, again, you know, you talked about yeah. the adults that you were, who, who have said, I wish I had a program like this when I was younger, but yeah. as a youngster, they're like, you're talking crap. It does, you know, we're invincible. Nothing's going to stop us, right? So I'm curious as to whether there's any tracking mechanism or if you are seeing any positive impact coming out of this, not, even if it's one person. I mean, to a certain extent, no, not yet, because I've only worked with maybe 150 kids so far. I haven't really had a chance to kind of track them down and find out anything about them or anything like that. And certainly didn't get any contact information and stuff like a research project would. Um, right now, I still have to develop some pre post, you know, questionnaires and stuff like that of what did you what did you think beforehand? What did you learn from this? What did you gain from it? I have to probably come up with some qualitative stuff first, before I really get into the quantitative. Um, not enough exposure yet to people. Just trying to get a just trying to get a handle on how to present it because ultimately I only founded stars on Valentine's Day 2018 so we're only about two and a half years old um, the first year was still trying to develop the concept and trying to get some people to support it and recognize the mission and care about it at all while trying to get into some schools and get it you know presented into the classroom a little bit and that's a struggle that is the, a huge struggle. It's a scary topic if you talk about domestic violence. It's a really scary topic when you talk about school shootings. And I don't think people really want to let that come in the front door. Um, that's why, again, I'm also trying, hoping that I can come in through athletic departments. So if I can work with the student athletes and sort of avoid the school principal, maybe I can get through. <laughs> But we'll see. It's a struggle. Yep. It's and you a struggle. and and we all know that, you know, for the most part, student athletes are the most popular, are the ones that a lot of students look up to or kind of right. hoped that they would do, you know, that they can be like the quarterback or the so on and so forth. And so maybe again, I think it's a great avenue that if you're going and and working with those students, that it there may might be some kind of kind of a trickle down effect. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's the whole idea is I, I, I would like schools to consider that we were trying to develop ambassadors of change. Mm -hmm. And that yes, student athletes are often student eaters. And if we get them to buy in, then the rest may follow. And if we get them to buy in, that's at least half the population. I'd say that's a win. Right. Um, now, we do have this new mechanism of trying to get stars into schools and um, Thank God I have the mechanism of the book because I haven't worked with little kids. I mean, I've worked with teenagers and I've worked with adults. So I have to admit at times when I'm trying to bring a message to the little ones, it's kind of a struggle. Um, but the book, um, The Big Fire, which of course, um, Mary uh, Tiffany's book, Stripes, is just the absolute accompaniment and follow. Um, 
you know, Tiffany, were, Tiffany and I were both given this opportunity to contribute to the book series, Bruno's Amazing Adventures, um, which is hosted by the um, Ever, what, Freebird Foundation of Evergreen. Somebody I know from a few years ago, she's the executive director. She started the concept with the books, et cetera. Um, surprised the snot out of me back in February when she asked me to write a book. <laughs> and then um, uh, it was, I was amazed at the outcome of it. Then Tiffany, that's how we met, met Tiffany. She brought, came in as a co-author as well. I just sent out 25 letters to the local elementary schools here offering to give the books to their classrooms and to their libraries and offering to do a book reading and hopefully we can get ourselves into the schools that way and start getting some recognition with the families. Um, I put an offer into the schools to just introduce a little bit of anti-bullying materials so that hopefully we can start educating the kids at that age. And um, yeah. Congratulations on that book. I, um, I will be ordering one because I think it's fantastic and I'm ordering Tiffany's as well. I'm super excited for both of you. It's, 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 you guys are doing such amazing work and I am honored and blessed to be a part of your circle. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. So we're coming up on the hour um, and I'm wondering if anyone had any questions. Um, I see that there's a so, yep, so there are two comments here. One says, thanks for talking about the connection between mental health, bullying, and school shootings. Um, and then the next, we have a question here. What can we do as non-professional educators or therapists to support people of any age that may be dealing with or in denial, in denial of this kind of issue? Oh, if they're in denial, that is definitely pushing the boulder uphill. All you can try to do is let them see experiences where it hasn't worked for other people. Because unfortunately, sometimes people really are hard headed and stubborn and they are going to learn the hardest way possible. I wish I had a better explanation for some of them out there. Um, just being caring. If you see somebody is struggling all you really need to do is approach them and say, hey, are you okay? Is there anything you need? Can I help you? And you know, the crazy thing is our, our population is really afraid of anything that's different and scary out there. And I think it's the brave who are willing to put themselves out and step in that allows others to see people really do care. Everybody I've worked with feels the world is so harsh that it is a cruel world that you have no choice but to fight. If we can keep showing people that that is not the truth, then we can helpfully overcome those mindsets. We can give others a new experience, a different experience. Just ask, what can I do to help you? Is there anybody I can contact? You know, what do you need from me? And sometimes it's just being able to put your hand on a shoulder and say, you know what, life is really tough at times and I know you're going to get through it. So put something positive in there to let them try to internalize it. Because again, the people who are struggling, they do not have a positive internal dialogue. They have a very negative internal dialogue that was put in there from childhood. They don't believe in themselves. They don't believe in the future. It's funny, with the racquetball classes um, that we've been doing for years, every once in a while you'll get a child who comes through who does not look very athletic. And um, I remember this one girl, you know, she had this super long black hair. It was all over her face. Everything she wore was black. She just, you know, the whole vibe. And I just... I said to her, I put my hand on her shoulder and I said, look, it's going to get better. It's going to be okay. It won't be as bad as it seems right now. And she just was stunned. She just had this stunned look on her face and then it sank in and then she just had this big grin. She said, thanks. If you can see somebody's in that position, just offer that. That's the best you can do. That's good. Thank you for that. I think a lot of people don't realize that it is 
literally as simple as asking someone, how are you? Um, any other questions? I know, again, we're, we're coming up to that hour. Um, Tiffany and I, and Duane, I hope you'll stay another few minutes afterwards when we stop the recording in case people have questions and, and comments that they want to make offline. Absolutely. Um, and if there are no other questions, Duane, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this was very informative. I have a, a, a pad full of notes here. It's fantastic. So thank you so much for your time, your expertise. Um, good luck on STARS uh, and congratulations on the book. Uh, we're excited. We will make sure to post links to all of that when we post the replay so people know um, how to get in touch with you regarding STARS and we'll post uh, a link about the book as well. Thank you to everybody who joined us. I appreciate it. Um, I was nervous as all hell. I don't consider myself an expert. Okay. Just somebody with a lot of years of experience. <laughs> you were great. Thanks, Duane. Thanks, everyone. Amazing. Thank you. Bye. Bye.